Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are, coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online and I'm live with you today. This is the talk show that hell hates. And uh, let's see here. John Hartnett is not going to like what I'm going to say today. I don't know who John Hartnett is. Uh, um, Let's see here. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I I don't know who this is. But this, I got an article today from uh, a good friend of mine up in Fargo. Brother Tim uh, sent this to me. And... I'm just I'm just in awe. I'm in awe of how people can just blatantly ignore scripture. Now, when you ignore something, that makes you ignorant. It make that, that's what it makes you when you ignore something, when something's there, And you ignore it. Now, there is willful ignorance. And there is just, you know, the average run of mill. Oh, I skip that or I overlook that. I do stuff like that all the time. Uh, And and now I'm going to say this. Sometimes it takes people a while to get up to speed on some things. I get that. At one time... I was on the other side of a lot of issues that I am now on this side on, including the Bible issue. Um, But God led me to a place where I, number one, he beat the daylights out of me uh, with his rod of correction. That's what he does to sons whom he loves. Uh, But then God led me to a place where I wanted to know what was true. I got tired of being lied to, tired, and the worst lies in the world, as far as I'm concerned, are religious lies. Because you're talking, you're dealing with someone's everlasting, eternal soul and where it spends eternity. So um, I got sent this article, and it really just bashes anybody who believes the scriptural account of where giants come from. Where giants come from. Now, I know I've been talking about the beast, and this is an addendum to that. Um, It's going to, it really, we're going to look at where giants come from and what does that mean concerning the future? Because, uh, somebody asked the question while we were in Fargo, how much of the Bible is prophecy? And my answer was the Bible, the whole thing. It all speaks of what is going to happen in the last days. Ecclesiastes, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. All ta- referenced these things written in the scriptures that they are for our learning and our edification unto whom the ends of the world are come. They're showing us, God is showing us the end of, by showing us things that have already happened. And you can, there is a prophecy and a, pro, a prophecy picture in everything that's in your Bible. This is, this is why we know what it is that we know about what's going to happen and why we don't guess and why we don't read somebody's chart and go, oh, that, oh, the, he wrote a chart, so he must know how the end's going to be. I don't follow charts, I read what the scripture says. But to, to, to just ignore blatant statements from the Scripture and then to call people out as heretics because they're the ones who are actually holding to what the Scripture says, I, I just, I don't know, I, I have a problem with it. 
So there's this article, and it's called The Nephilim Problem. The Nephilim Problem. Uh, I'll read, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a long article. And, yeah, let me, let me just, and I'll say this. Number one, it's good to be back. It is good to be here today. It's good to be alive and well and moving forward. Um, the devil hit me hard when we came home last week. Hard. And it, it always, you know, it, it helps me to think along this line. That you, you know that you have either um, walked into s- something. H- how can I say this? If 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 you do, if you walk past a beehive, and you don't see it, the bee will let you know that you just came way too close to their hive. They'll let you know. They they will announce their themselves very quickly. And a lot of times when you personally disturb the devil, when you have get when you have gotten into his realm, when you have approached his den too close, um, you see, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And and I believe that devils are not afraid of your average everyday run of the mill human being. Because humans, man is made lower than the angels. But I believe without a doubt that a person who is filled with the Spirit of Christ in them, the living Word of God abiding in under them, when you walk too close to the devil's lair, you are a threat. He is very, very afraid of you. And I watch a guy on YouTube, he's Rob the Ranger. And he does safaris. He's, he runs a, a park down in, um, I think it's South Africa, or Zimbabwe, somewhere around in there, Kruger National Park. And um, he they film lions all the time, and they get pretty close to them. And people ask him, are these lions, do they, they, are, they, uh, are they worried about us? And he says, no, they're used to us as long as we don't get out and try to steal their food. And then... It, and that what he's meaning by that is the lions are not when when they see man, they're not immediately thinking food. They're thinking fear. Now these lions have so many people coming by all the time that they've gotten used to it, but that's because no man has ever been a threat to those lions is, is trying to take away their food. If that were the case, then the lions would come out and attack. They're attacking out of fear, not out of food. Now, if they happen to kill you and you're still laying there, they will eat you. But my point is this. When you have God's Spirit inside of you, when you have Jesus living in you, when, when wherever you go, Jesus is with you, when you get too close to where the devil is hiding or an area of his domain, when you get there, he will come out and snarl his teeth at you and sh- hunch his shoulders up real big and he will enlarge himself and he will he will come after you and that happened last week when i got back and that tells me that i've either already walked into a domain where the lion is or I'm close to one. I haven't got there yet. I haven't said something yet that the devil is afraid that I'm going to say. Or something that God is going to say through me. So it's either one or the other. And I don't really know. I don't I don't really care which one it is. Um, I still want to keep doing what I'm doing. But it hit me hard. And it took a lot of prayer. And a lot of just working through some things. I appreciate all of your prayers. I do. Because I need them. 
There are times I'm not normally afraid of people. It's spirits that really get me. And um, so I appreciate all the prayers, all the support, all the friendship, the encouragement, the letters, the emails. And please forgive me if I don't respond to all of them. I There is no way in the world I could keep doing what I'm doing and then respond to everybody that writes us or whatever. And I feel bad about that, but I just, I don't, there's not enough hours in my day to do this. Uh, And I'll tell you this, now that I know what I know about gods, little g gods, and what's going to happen to them. Now, when I found that in scripture two weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, this Thursday, uh, I'm rewriting the script for this UFO thing. There was things that I would not talk about prior to me going to Fargo, but I mean just a, a week before we go to Fargo, God showed me something absolutely astounding, and I'll share it with you today. I talked about it uh, before we left. I'll remind you again today what it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back through that script, and I'm going to reprogram it somehow. Uh, to add in the new information that I have. But let me read, uh, l- let's deal with that as we deal with the Nephilim problem that this guy says we have. The word Nephilim is found in the Old Testament Bible, only the Hebrew. And some have suggested that their existence before the global flood of those day was the reason God sent it to destroy all air-breathing life on the surface of the earth. Sir, there is both biblical and archaeological evidence that giants, giant sized people have existed, but was there really ever a Nephilim problem? And he keeps saying this thing all throughout this article. Was there a Nephilim problem? Does it look like a Nephilim problem to me? Everybody's saying they had a Nephilim problem. Nephilim problem. There's a Nephilim problem here, but it doesn't look like a Nephilim problem to me. He says that a lot. Could it be that uh, that, that was at least part of the reason God sent the flood? There is much written about this controversial subject, for example, in books and on the web, and as well as online video discussions and documentaries and articles proposing that certain elongated ancient skulls are from the Nephilim. Now, I don't know that, so I've never talked about it. Some articles refer to a Nephilim problem. See, there he says it again. And that part of the reason for God sending blood was to stop Nephilim problems. He's, he's overly infatuated with the phrase Nephilim problem. But was there really a Nephilim problem at all? Uh, really? Come on. Get over it. Um, the word Nephilim is derived from the Hebrew word Nephil, which appears in Genesis 4. Now I'm going to read the King James. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old. I believe that. Exactly the way it's written. Now, here's where here, here's where everybody goes wrong. Various versions translate this as giants or not at all, leaving the untranslated Hebrew word where the ending I am indicates it is plural. The Nephilim, and then he's quoting the English Standard Bible. There's a mistake. Um, the Nephilim were on the earth, and they see what the English Standard Version did was take out the word giants. And when you take out the word giants, then you don't have a story here. You have a non-event. If you take out the giants out of the scriptures, Paul can't even teach you about salvation from the book of Hebrews. Without the giants, they're that important to Bible prophecy, Bible doctrine, Bible understanding. So he says, my Hebrew dictionary, which is the Mickelson's and Hans Strong's Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, 2008, translates nephil as a feller, someone who fells trees, a bully or a tyrant. And I, I'm, I can tell you after reading this article that that's the translation that he likes the best. These giants were just bullies. 
they were they they may have been like taller than the average Jew, which you don't have to be tall at all to be taller than a Jew. But they were bullies. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, then he says, the brown driver of Briggs lexicon gives the meaning of Nephilim as giants. Many have suggested the correct interpretations are based on the assumption that the word is a derivative of the Hebrew verbal root, blah, blah. I don't get in all this stuff. Hence the translation follow ones. But according to the brown driver Briggs lexicon, the basic etymology of the word Nephilim is dubious. You know what that means? Doubtful. In other words, we don't believe it. And various suggested interpretations are, quote, all very precarious. And this is what the article says. But no one really knows precisely what the word Nephilim means. <coughs> There's where you went wrong. Because my Bible, which is the Word of God, says giants, not Nephilim. And that's what the Hebrew says. But it says giants. And there is a, I mean, when I did this thing on the giants several years ago, I went into the Hebrew a little, little bit to show you that there, there's a consistency in the language of the King James when, when it comes to who these things were. These King James translators were, number one, they were being led to do what they were doing, but these guys were smart guys anyway. And, and they knew, and I believe that the Spirit helped them tie all of these passages together that deal with the giants so that you would know exactly what you were talking about. Um, let's see here. So he gets into this nonsense about who the sons of God are. So that's where I'm going to pick it up from. Or let me say it this way. He gets into this nonsense about who the sons of God aren't. Um, let's see here. In the New Testament, sons of God always refer to redeemed human beings that I agree with. But there's something there. Why don't you quote the scriptures? Uh, let's see here. What else does he say? He keeps saying Nephilim problem over and over and over again. Uh, let's see here. What, what else did he say? He concluded, as I'll tell you this. Here's one of the conclusions that he came up with. And I've, I've, I've tried to put together for you for today... Uh, some notes on exactly why I believe what I believe. And basically what he says is there is no reference at all in the Bible to what he says is a human-demon hybrid. No reference whatsoever. Doesn't exist. Um, let's see here. He, he actually says, okay, get this. My opinion, who cares? My opinion is that the giantism that existed before and after the flood was derived from the original created genetic information that God created in the first man, Adam, and was passed to all humankind. Because of the sin in the heart of man, tradition and sin has embellished the stories beyond scope. That's a lie. That is a lie right there. To say, to say that the stories that are in the Bible are embellished, you have no idea what you're talking about. To make everybody believe that the giantism that we see in the scriptures was just ordinary, standard, run-of-the-mill genetics that Adam had that God gave him. And, you know, we still have giants showing up now. Uh, not 13 and a half foot tall giants. You don't. 
like Og, not like the kind of giants that were in the land of Canaan. And I, boy, I missed that out of my notes. I got, we got to talk about that. Not the kind of giants that you see in the land of Canaan when the 12 spies go in and they said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And we were as grasshoppers unto them. In other words, our ratio of human to giant was like a human to a grasshopper. That's huge. To call that an embellishment is ridiculous. Joshua and Caleb, when they come back, they saw the same thing that these other ten did. They just drew a different conclusion. Joshua and Caleb, at no time did they ever say, hey, these guys are lying to you. They weren't that tall. Ah, you get maybe six feet three, six feet four, but they were not that tall. These guys are lying to you. They never said that. Not once. They confirmed the story that those men were like to us. We were grasshoppers to them in comparison. So that then, when you think about all of these pyramids that are all over the world and all these megaliths, these humongous stone edifices that, number one, nobody to this day can figure out how they were made. The quarried stones that make up the foundation of the wall at Baalbek to this day, nobody in the world can figure out, number one, how it was done, and number two, nobody could even figure out why it was done that way. When you can build a stone wall built out of stones that are much easier to move. So why build a, a stone wall with quarried stones that are in excess of 2,000 tons? Not pounds. Tons. That's what you get at Baal Beck. So don't give me this nonsense that these were just regular giants that pop up from time to time in human history and that, that, that genetic was what was part of what God put in Adam at that time at what everybody else says is an embellishment of the story. I'm not buying it. So let's just uh, open up a can of King James, shall we? Revelation 13, his, and, and I'm doing this for a reason. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count out the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Now notice the configuration here. Beast and man. Now, a hundred years ago, a beast was a beast and not a man, and a man was a man and not a beast. But that, that was a hundred years ago. But in the age of CRISPR, DNA editing, in that age, we now have the ability to fuse human and animal DNA. It's never been done before. Well, I don't say it's never been done before in the history of man. What I'm going to say is, it has been done. It's just been thousands of years ago. Um, anyway, Revelation. back to Revelation 13. It's the number of a man and a number of a beast. And if you think about it, what was created on day six of creation? Beasts and man together. Uh, in Job, let's see, where is it? Job chapter 40. When uh, God reminds Job about the things that he's made, including Le uh, the behemoth, in Job 40, verse 15, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. I think what that means is that behemoth, this massive, huge, four-legged beast of the earth, was created on the same day that 
that man was created. So on, And there you have the meaning for the number six, or part of the meaning. You pick up another part of the meaning of this number, 603 score and six, by looking in Genesis 6, the sons of God and the daughters of men. But th- that configuration there of man and beast together is something now that's not only not unheard of, it's being worked on as we speak. You have to understand, we live in a time where the gods are inspiring scientists all over the world to do things that man probably would have never figured out how to do it on his own. We are living in that age. And the configuration of man and beast together that I, you just got to know that in some laboratory somewhere, maybe on an island where, you know, if they escape their cage, then we still have them contained. But somewhere there has got to be a lab where scientists are mixing human and animal genetic material together to see what would happen. Because now we can do it so easily with CRISPR and Cas9 DNA editing. And the gene drive. We can now do this. So it's not, this is, this is not an embellishment. This is science fact and it's prophecy fact. Then look at Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottom pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life, the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not. Yet is. He was. Notice that's past tense. But notice then the language. Is not yet it is. Those are present tense words. And in, my, in our understanding of the world, you can't do that. You can't say Santa Claus does not exist. Yet it does exist. That's, you can't do that. You can't say your wife calls honey where are you uh i'm at work but i'm not at work okay then you're at work no i'm at work but i'm not at work well then where are you then i'm at work but i'm not at work you can't do that but this beast is what god is showing you here is opposites things that are oppositional to each other Let's look at, uh, let's see here. Let's flip this over here. Here we go. Got our trusty uh, inspired version of the Bible, the King James. Um, where am I going with it? Second Corinthians 6. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Ye who are the saints should not do yoga. Why did you change topics? Well, I technically I didn't. Because the word yoga means yoke. Means connection. And you're connecting to Brahma. Or Brahma's avatar. And the avatars of the Indian religion were a human representation of a god. That's who they were. They were human, half human, half god. In uh, James Cameron's movie, Avatar, that's why he chose the title for that. Because, and you just kind of have to think about it. That whole story of Avatar is sort of like a... Aesop's fable of Earth, because it has meaning to it. The planet Pandora is Earth, and the Pandorans are the Earth people. And who do the Pandorans fear? The sky people. Are you getting this? But it's the humans that are the sky people, and it's the humans then 
who through this genetic thing and this whatever machine they have, they put your consciousness into a Pandoran so that you are an avatar. You're part human, the sky people, and part beast because the Pandorans have like little cat ears and tails. Okay? You're, you're in the movie Avatar. The people who were avatars were human and beast at the same time. So Paul says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, you can mingle with unbelievers. You can talk to unbelievers. You can witness unbelievers. But you cannot yoke yourself together with them. Be careful. People, be careful. I want to give you some advice. Something that I've learned. When you have lost people who are your friends, be careful of them. Because if Ephesians 2 tells us that there is a prince of the power of the air that dwells inside of them, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and while you may think that they are your friend, they are an agent for the other side, our enemies. They may act friendly to you. They may act like they're inter And you might say, well, I'm close to them because I want to lead them to the Lord. Let me tell you what God said about that. God said, be not unequally yoked together with them and to come away from them. Now, if they want anything to do at all with Jesus Christ, they also will be willing to come out because that's what we did, is it not? I mean, God led me out of a whole, you have to understand, the denomination I grew up in, those were my heroes. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to serve them. I would have given myself, my ministry, my everything that God gave me, I would have yielded over to the denomination. And it hurt me greatly, and still does, to be rejected by them. And I've been rejected by people in the denomination that I thought were my friends. And it hurts immensely. But you are who you are. You are who God made you to be. And the funny thing is, when we, and we all do this, when we try to mingle ourselves in with lost people, we tend to stop acting like saved people around them. It's the truth. So it really never works out. We always try to be more like them in order to please them rather than being what God called us to be and letting Christ be lifted up in our lives. And he said, that will draw all men on me. But us yoking ourselves with unbelievers, that doesn't work. It never has. It's not God's way of doing it. And even if you think you have succeeded in that they started coming to your church or whatever, understand that they are still a member of the other team. And I mean it. God calls us out. He does not tell us to stay in, infiltrate, get them to like you, then I'll say, no, that's not what he says. If I be lifted up, I will draw all, all men unto me. But there are some people that when Christ is lifted up in your life, they're going to hate your gut. They're going to hate you for it. And they want nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing. And I'm telling you, it is, it is one of the worst feelings in the world to feel like you're alone. 
but I'd rather be John on the Isle of Patmos by myself on the Lord's day, serving the Lord, being in the Spirit, than I would be a watered-down version of who God wants me to be, mingled in with everybody else, just because, well, I think if I stay with them, I might, I might lead them out. You can't lead them out. You're not out yourself. You're in. There's a lot of wisdom in that. You take this now. You you go you go take what I said and go all through the scriptures. Study Ruth. You study Ruth. Ruth left the land of her nativity. Study Abraham. The land that God gave Abraham was not the land that he was born in. And you'll see that one after another after another, God had to lead them out. Not keep them in. I have another example of that, but I'll show you to you in a little bit. But anyway, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? See it? What communion hath light with darkness? The Masonic floor of their lodge rooms are black and white checkered floors. Is it because they like checkers and chess and they play it on the floor? Nope. They believe that it's the union of light and darkness together. It's the Antichrist. What well, concord hath Christ with Belial? Satan tried three times to get Jesus into an agreement with him. And all three times Jesus quoted scripture why he couldn't do it. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? By the way, there's six things here. Ye unbelievers, that's one. Fellowship with uh, righteousness with unrighteousness, that's two. Communion of light and darkness, that's three. Concord with Christ and Belial, that's four. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? That's five. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? That's six. Ba, ba, ba. So six things here, but look, God said, um, for here the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. God's called you out. He's going to call, God knows how to call them out. If God knows they're going to be saved, don't you think God would have already figured out how he's going to save them? He's already figured it out. It's a lesson I've had to learn. It's a lesson I'm going through now. I don't like it, but I'm going through it. So that's the opposites there that make up who this man of sin is. And Jesus is the opposite of this. Whereas he is not, not yet is. Christ said, I am he who was dead and am now alive, but not, I'm not the one who's alive and dead at the same time. Now, in Genesis 6, we're going to get into the meat of it. We're going to, we're going to examine the Bible and its words only. And see, the, the, the thing that really gets me about articles like this and people like this is that they accuse us all of getting our fairy tale stories from the book of Enoch. As as God led me out of the the ways of thinking that I used to think about eschatology and by prophecy. So I said to God, God, I want a clean slate. I want to start all over again. And you teach me what you want to teach me. I also, at one time, used to read the book of Enoch and say, I think Enoch, you know, it's not in Scripture. It shouldn't be in Scripture. But I think, you know, Jude's telling us to read Enoch because Jude did. That's not true. It's not true. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. You keep arguing with it. Or is that that voice in my head? But anyway, I'll, I'll prove it to you. You show me where Jude said... Book of Enoch, 
or was written by Enoch. He doesn't. What he says is, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying. The Holy Ghost told Jude what Enoch said. Jude didn't quote what Enoch wrote. Now, I don't know who wrote the book of Enoch. I know that Enoch did not write the book of Enoch. So, there it is. I And, they, and all, anytime somebody doesn't like the idea of the sons of God, daughters of men theory, they say, you're getting it from the book of Enoch. That's your problem. No, I'm not. I threw that out a long time ago, too. And I said, I don't trust it. And I mean it. It has been... I'm going to say it's been beyond, what year is this, 2019? I'm going to say it well beyond 15 to 20 years ago that I even looked at the book of Enoch. Because I'm, I'm not kidding you, I walked away from it. I said, I don't trust it. I only trust what's in my Bible, period, the end. So, and it, so it just annoys me that they accuse us of following the fairy tales of Enoch because I don't. I follow scripture and I can prove what I'm saying. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, men. In a generic way, he's saying men. He does not give a lineage. He does not give a particular bloodline of men. He just says when men began to multiply and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now, right there, you're seeing opposites. Sons of God, daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them, wives of all which they chose. Now, I, somebody brought up a good point, and, and I like it. You don't really see the wives being willing participants here. That's a good point. Because it looks like that it was solely the sons of God who took what they chose. Come here, you. You know. Now, maybe once the woman got going with it, maybe, you know, she's like, okay, I like this. But it was the sons of God taking what they wanted to take. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet is this to be in 120 years. There's another little clue here. Do you see it? Get my pen. Flesh. Men. Daughters. My spirit should not always strive with man because man is flesh. So it's kind of indicating to you here that like all of these things are doing something. I'm not reading something into them that they're not there or it's not allowed. Men are flesh. There's no denying that. Yet his day shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. The King James Bible says giants. So you know what I believe? I believe that there was a race of people called the giants. Not just a, a genetic um, abnormality that popped up every now and then from the lineage of Adam. That is that is the one of the most ridiculous things I've heard. And also after that, meaning those days, it happened. Now, Pastor Jason Cooley and I were talking about when would it have been that this event occurred after the flood? I don't know yet. Is it even knowable? I don't know. If it's not knowable, then that's God saying to us, it doesn't matter, move on to something else. Because when the Bible is silent about something, it is God's way of saying, don't dwell on this. I have other things for you to dwell on. I'm silent about this. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant to what I'm going to do in the last days. So just move on from there. 
So that's what you do. And also after. So it doesn't tell us exactly when it happened. No, we can speculate. We can guess. But we don't, we don't really know for sure. But we just believe that it happened also after that. And we believe that the giants were the direct result of when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Now, just as bashfully as I can say, we all get the idea of when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. We know what that means. Because they bear children to them. They, meaning the daughters of men, bore children to them, meaning the sons of God. The same, these giants, became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, yes, every civilization... The Native Americans, the uh, the British, the Europeans, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Siberians, the Africans, they all tell giant stories, every single one of them. This event happened not only, and when, when they tell the stories of the giants, without fail, there is a mingling of gods and humans without fail. So, the fossilized remains of the truth of the Word of God are these stories men of, of the men of renown. Men that were known, that's what renown means, they were known all over the world. And generation after generation after generation told the stories of the giants, and they told the stories of the gods who came down who saw good-looking women on the beach. All right? So that's you have the mention of giants in Genesis 6. Now, the next time they're mentioned, Genesis 14. Interesting story. Because these giants, let's just say this. You have the human communities, then you have the giant communities. And the humans always hate the giants and probably vice versa. I mean, they always did. When you look in Genesis 14, the 14th year came Keter Laomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Karnaim. The Rephaims were giants. Notice that they named their home town yeah, I get it. I, I, I'm still being told that my audio is choppy, and I have no idea why. I've reinstalled Wirecast. Maybe I'll look at trying to update some drivers. I don't know. I don't know what to do. Anyway, uh, but the Rephaims chose the name of their town as Ashtaroth. Which sort of gives you a, a clue. The giants, the Rephaims, did not worship God, the God, the Most High God. They chose lesser gods to be their gods. They chose Baal. They chose Ashtaroth, the male and the female, the yin and the yang. Why did they do that? Did you know Ashtaroth represents, Ashtaroth is Gaia, the fertility goddess. She is the goddess of, of the earth, or is the earth herself. Baal is a lord out of the skies. So even their own religion celebrated their parentage. The giants knew where they came from. They came from the lords, the gods up in heaven, and they came from the Ashtaroth women, the fertility goddess women of the earth. But anyway, you have the smiting of the Rephaims, the Zuzims in Ham. Very interesting that the Zuzims lived in the land of, of Ham. 
green ham. Because there is at least three connections or three possible clues as to who was Nimrod really. Now, legend says Nimrod was a giant. Now, I have not seen the scripture yet. If Nimrod was, in fact, a giant, I don't know. My question would be, how did that happen? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, the Zuzims were in Ham, and the Emims in Shava Kirithium, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, which is where Edom finally settled, Esau, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So you have the Rephiams, the Zuzims, the Emims, and the Horites. One, two, three, four. See that number? I'll write it up here on the screen for you. Why, why does it mention four groups here? I think it's relevant because I think, and, and again, you know, these numbers, these patterns that I show you in the Bible, you know, they're not the meat and the potatoes, but they are the gravy that goes on the meat and potatoes, or if you prefer, sauce. They're the sauce for the goose. They're not the goose, but they're the sauce for the goose. I think they accentuate. I think they help understand or help us understand what's, what all is. I think it gives us depth of what's being said here. So I believe then that this then would be related to what the fourth kingdom really is all about. In Numbers, now we have them again. Here's the next time they're mentioned. So we're gonna get, get we're gonna open up our Bible on this one. Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 14, because this is highly relevant. And I was gonna include this. I I built this PowerPoint just two hours ago. And I was gonna include all these passages from Numbers. 13 and 14, but I, I I got moving on to some other things and forgot to come back to it. It's highly relevant. I, I, I just skip over this because, I mean, there's Bible doctrine related to this story right here. And I'll show it to you. Numbers 13. So they went up and searched the land. This is Moses sending out the 12, one from each tribe. The numbers here are going to teach us something as well. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin, which I think also is the wilderness of Sin, S-I-N. I think that's the same wilderness. Zin and Sin is the same, I think. Under Rehob, that's, you know, when you have a car accident and your back's hurt and you have to go into Rehob. Ah, <laughs> come on. I know that was funny. <laughs> you know that was. <laughs> So the 12 spies had to go to Rehob. As men came to Hamath, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, Anak is that giant. But here's my, here's my idea. Anak was not the direct descendant of a fallen angel with a human woman. His daddy was. His father, does anybody know what his father's name was? Arba. Joshua 14. We have... Um, Hebron before, therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel 
and the name of Heaven before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. But he's, he's more than just a great man among the Anakims. Joshua 15 tells us that Arba was the father of Anak, which is the city of Hebron. And there he says it again in verse in chapter 21. And he gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which this is the city is Hebron. So the children of Anak were the offspring of Anak and probably a human woman. But Anak himself was probably, well, I don't believe that he was. I don't believe that Anak was the direct descendant of a god. He was the descendant of Arba, and we don't have anybody listed in the lineage of Arba. In other words, it goes to Arba and then stops. So to me, that would seems like it would indicate, or it'd be highly possible, that Arba's father was a god with a little g, a very little, little, little g, tiniest g that you can get. That's who Arba was. And then Arba then, probably finding a woman, a human woman, and mating with her to create Anak. And, and what we know from the scriptures is that over, the, over time, the giants get smaller in stature. Whereas you have Og, Who's the Bible talks about his bed being like um oh what was his uh what was his bed? How t- how tall it was it? it? Was Og. Uh let's see here. Og Og, that's Og. He dwelt in Ashtaroth. Uh where was it? Where does it say it? Uh, the coast of Og talks about his bed being so many cubits. Uh, iron and look up iron because his bed. Ah, th- yeah, that's interesting. His bed was made of iron, right? There we go. Deuteronomy three eleven. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Uh, and it was nine cubits. So nine cubits turns out to be about 13 and a half feet tall. But then as time goes on, have um, you get down to Goliath. Goliath is, is, is only a whopping six cubits and a span tall, not nine cubits. So six cubits in a span works out. Still, I mean, still, that's over nine, ten feet tall. But it's not the 13 and a half feet that Og was. So what I see in this is as the hybrids continue to mate with humans, the size goes down. They're not as tall then as Let's say probably Arba was, and we don't know how tall Arba was. But if we believe that the spies, the number they were giving us, the numbers 13, was an accurate ratio. Uh, Let's see here. Let's say that, uh, let's do a little math here. Um. Let's see. uh, Let's say a, a, a... a grasshopper is what two inches tall? Two inches. Let's say your average human is seventy-two inches tall. That's six feet. So you have a ratio of seventy-two to two, or that would come out to be. 36 to 1. So if a human, ratio of 36 to 1, if a human is 72 inches tall, a six foot tall human, 
All you have to do then is multiply that by 36. You get 2,592 inches divided by 12, 216 feet. Now, that's a lot of feet. It's a lot of feet. And I can't, I don't know 100%. But if you got a guy, let's say a 100 foot tall, could two of those guys pick up a stone block that weighs in excess of 100 tons, 500 tons? Could they do that? I'd say it's probably, I'd say they probably could. Now, here's where, here's, here's where you run into the difference between us and them. Us, we believe the Bible no matter what it says. We believe it unconditionally. Now again, we're not we're not given the exact number of the tallest giant ever. But even at 13 and a half feet tall, that's a big fella. That is huge. And see, most people don't even believe that one. Even though we're given a precise measurement, most people don't buy it. Oh, I might believe nine feet, but I don't believe nine cubits. Okay. okay. And that's where you run into the difference between us and them. We we believe rule number one. Rule number one is there is not a single mistake in the Bible. Rule, rule number two, if somebody says, I think there's a mistake in the Bible, we go back to rule number one and say there is no mistake in the Bible, ever. And I want to teach you something. It doesn't hurt you to believe what God said in his word. Now, that, that number you with, 216 feet tall, you don't have to believe that because that number is not given in the process or absolutely in Scripture in that exact language. Doesn't say it exactly that way. But if the Bible tells you something, it I just want to encourage you, it doesn't it doesn't hurt you to believe it. In fact, it'll probably help you. We have no idea yet what we're about to see come down in human history. But I think to those who are marginally believe the Bible, but kind of on the edge of unbelief of certain things, I think that we're going to see things that's going to mess with them. But God's people who just say, you know what, I believe the Bible, believe every word of it, we're going to see something we're going to go, yeah, that makes sense. Doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, look at what the Bible says. Right? I think that's how it's going to happen. So anyway, um, number 13, we have Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai, and the children of Anak. Again, four of them. Look at that. Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai, the children of Well, actually, I'm wrong. There's three. Let me read that again. Where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children. Okay, I get that. There's three here. Who are, are the children of Anak? Were. Hebron was built, but we, we do have a four here, and I'll show it to you. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, why is the Bible going out of the way to tell you that? What significance does it have that, the, that Moses had to tell you that Hebron was built seven years before Zoe in Egypt. Who cares, right? But the number's there. The number's there. The number seven. Okay? Hang on to that. And they came under the brook of Eshkol and cut down thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two two on his staff. Now, either... Either this is the most ridiculous sight in the world where two guys with this large pole on their shoulders carrying a little bitty cluster of grapes that granny can kick up at Walmart. Or it took two men with, an, with a wooden beam on their shoulder to hold this one cluster of grapes. I believe the latter. That's what I believe. 
They brought out pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Brook of Echol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut from thence. So apparently this cluster of grapes. Now, I'm going to give you a, uh, a neat scenario to go with this. It actually is it, It's one of these Bible encouragement things. Notice that it says a cluster of grapes. Isaiah said something about a cluster. You know what he said? He said, where is it? Did Isaiah say it? Where is it? Where does it say new wine is found in the cluster? I'm missing it. Where is it? Cluster. Ah, there it is. Isaiah 65, 8. I don't know why, why I didn't see it. Thus saith the Lord, as a new wine is found in the cluster. Now think about it. New wine. It's the spirit. It's like the new covenant. You can't put new wine in old bottles. The old bottles is our flesh. You cannot put new wine in old bottles. It has to be a new bottle. So the new wine is the new covenant, the promise of God. How many people are bringing it to? It's like two witnesses, Old and New Testament, the two parts of your Bible, Old and New. The two witnesses, the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. So what this story is, it's a prophetic typology of how Israel is going to end up believing that Jesus is the Messiah because the new wine that's in the cluster is going to be brought by two. When Jesus sent out witnesses that he was the Lord, how did he send them out? And who did he send them to? He sent them to the people of Israel. How did he send them out? By twos. So you have the two bringing in the new cluster to the people of Israel. The first time it happens, they're going to reject it. Because they need to look at that, that new wine in that cluster. But then they hear the story. The ten of the spies are going to tell them. And they're going to not going to not believe that they can go into the land. And God's going to let them die in the wilderness. So they, because of the, now look at verse 25. And they return from searching of the land after 40 days. 40 days. Remember, it was 40 days in the days of Noah. And that, that 40, that number being there points you to the fourth kingdom. The false gospel kingdom. And what they are and how it's going to be presented to this world is what this story is doing. Um, let's go to... Let's finish, let's finish the story there in Numbers 13 because it's very, very relevant to us living in this day. In verse 26, they went and came to Moses and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land... Whither thou seest, sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities were walled and very great. Think of Baal Beck. And that foundation stone on that wall, and then there's one sticking out of the ground. The largest quarried stone in the world is halfway sticking up out of the ground. And nobody knows how it got there. They don't know how it was quarried. They don't know who chiseled it. They don't know who transported it and who would have laid it to be the foundation. They have no idea how that happened. I do. I get it. Giants did it. Big ones. Mean rascals. And there's your clue right there. And notice that he said... Um, the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. 
So how many do we have here? Children of Anak, Amalekites, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, the Canaanites. Six. Bum, bum, bum. Those numbers mean something. So everybody's all worked up in a froth. And another number that is in this is the number 10. Because 12 went in, but two of them said, of course we can go in. That's our land. God, God promised that to Abraham, our father. God told Moses that we would go in that land. God told Moses that we would eat those giants for breakfast. Come on, let's go. Two of them, just, just like the two witnesses that bring in the cluster of grapes, the new wine. It's the first and second coming, whereby the first coming, they don't believe. The second coming, they will. And so the two, Joshua and Caleb, are the two. And by the way, they are the only two that came out of Egypt. Over 600,000 people. Well over 600,000 people that left Egypt. Out of that whole group, two walk in the promised land. Now, of course, they don't walk in alone. They walk in, and here's another illustration. In those 40 years, the old generation has to die so the new generation can go into the land. You see that? The first has to die so the second God said he's taken away the first and he may establish the second. And he didn't say the first what or the second what. He didn't say what because it's universally applied. It's like the old and the new covenant. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Like our birth. Our first birth has to be taken away so he can establish us in the second birth. Meaning our old birth, our old body has to die so he can establish the second body. It always works that way. So you have the two that says, yes, we can go in, but you have the ten. That's just the law, and the law will always tell you you can't go. That's what the law was for. The law was to convince you that you are so unclean and filthy and despised, scum of the earth, because of your disobedience of God's word. You can't go if you listen to the law. You can't go in. So that's, that's all you Hebrew roots people that are probably not listening anyway. But that's to you anyway. Because you think that you can keep part of the law and please God? You're a liar. You're a liar. You're deceiving others. Others have deceived you, and now you're deceiving yourself into thinking that. Well, God wants me to keep as much of the law as I can. Then grace is applied. That is not what the Bible says. They met in Jerusalem in Acts 15 and discussed this whole This has already been settled by the church. The church settled it. The apostles, the elders, the bishops, they all got together and discussed it rationally. They discussed it by scriptures. James stood up. James, a Jew, the brother of Jesus, stood up and said, why should we compel the Gentiles to keep the law? We never did. So why should they have to go get circumcised? Why should they keep the feast days? They have Moses, and they have the synagogues, and they have the rabbis to read Moses every Sabbath day. So why should we compel the Gentiles to live after the manner of the Jews when not even the Jews lived after, lived after the manner of the Jews? The law and you breaking the law, all that does is tell you you're not going to heaven. That's why the law comes first and Christ comes second to fulfill the law and in his righteousness, if we believe his words, we get to go. And God proved that there at Eshkol. He proved it by saying, those of you who did not believe what I said, you're going to perish in the wilderness. But the two that did believe what I said, you get to go to the promised land. 
And you got to understand that all those children that were born in the wilderness, they had to bury every last parent of theirs before God would let them go into the promised land. Every one of them. Every one of them that saw the Red Sea open died in the wilderness with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. And it's really neat because um, I'll show you something in a minute. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. Evil report is the opposite of a good report. Isaiah 53 says, who has believed our report? And Isaiah 53 is about everything that they did to Jesus on the cross. And Paul said that was obedience to the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? You believe the report. It's faith, people. I ain't got much good works. But I've got faith. That's what gets you through the hard attacks that you endure. And it's not easy. So they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. All the people. You see, when these when people start questioning you about how evil God is, God God killed God's a racist. He killed all. He told, told Joshua to kill all those people, the, the poor innocent people. Well, number one, we are God's creation. Therefore, we are whatever God wants to do with us. God has rights over his creation. And because God created everything, God, God could wipe it all out like he did in the days of Noah. That's exactly what he did. God had a right to kill every man, woman, and child on the earth. Because God's justice saw the wickedness of man, that they were breaking God's law, and God said, it, it's got to stop. And because God is the creator, then God has rights over his own creation. Did you know that as long as you don't try to get, as long as you don't try to defraud the insurance company by doing it, you can burn down your own house and you can wreck your own car if you want. There's not a law that says you cannot destroy your own property. Not a law against it. As long as you don't try to defraud your insurance company or as long as your mortgage is paid or whatever. If it's your property, you can do whatever you want to with it. And that's the point here. Even if these people in Canaan land were all human beings, God still has a right over them to destroy them if he wants. They are and we are God's creation. And God has rights. But the Bible's telling us I mean, this is what, this is not what the spy said. This is what Caleb said. The guy that God said, he's got a different spirit in him. Caleb said, all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. All of them. So I believe it. Now, in the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, I'm sure that there was diminishing of that bloodline. But I believe that all the people that they saw in it were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. It's a ratio. Now, did he mean grasshoppers on their feet or grasshoppers standing up? I mean, I don't know. That kind of changes the ratio. I don't know. So, and we're not told that. So apparently that's not the important issue here. But let me show you what's in Numbers 14 and why Caleb said what he said. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. They didn't repent. They murmured. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. See, that's how people are. 
who come in, pretend to get right with God, pretend to serve God in the church, and then something makes them mad, something burns them, they don't. They think everybody in the church is hypocrites, or they didn't like the pastor preaching out of the book of Genesis, or whatever, and they get thrown, and they get all burned in their head, and 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 they get mad, and they say, I, I was better off back, back in the bar days. I was better off back then. And they go back. I've seen it happen time after time after. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but it still hurts. I have people that, since I've been pastor here, run out of this church. Blame me for their fall. And it's just an excuse. They want to go back to the old lifestyle, the old ways, but the bottom line is they did it because they wanted to do it. So, wherefore the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that the wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return to into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us take a captain. You see that word, captain? Captain. Has the word cap in it. I'm not making it up. Ahead. The music phrase de capo means my my music teacher Dennis Nall always said de capo goes on to hedo. Take take him the top. That's what it means. De capo. Go back to the beginning. Top. That's where the word captain comes from. The head. The top. Let's make a new head. Get it? Christ is the head of the body. Moses was in the place of Christ at this time. So they said, give us a new one. Let's make our own. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Let's return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all this city of the congregation of the children of Israel and got a bloody nose. No, I, I added that. That's not really there. But that would happen to me if I fell on my face. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. I don't know why they just didn't buy them. I don't know why they had to rent them. What was it? Tux it must have been tuxedos. That's what it was. They rented their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delighted us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, and a land which floweth milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Do you look at, do you look at this? We're going to eat these guys for breakfast. I love giant on toast. Uh, yes, can I have a, a giant on, on eye, please? Thank you. They are bread for us. Uh, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle, the congregation for all the children of Israel. Uh-oh, now God showed up. But look at the speech that Caleb made. Look at what he's, he's pleading with them. Don't do this. That's me and every other preacher out there that's still good, that's pleading with everybody else. Don't go back to Egypt. Please don't go. What you think is back there waiting for you is not. It's going to be worse. Because the minute that you show up back in Egypt, they'll kill you dead. See, some of you have thought, and I'm, I'm this way. I always think, I thought when I got on Facebook the first time that if I looked up all my old high school buddies that we could actually go back and it would be like we were high school buddies all over again. Boy, was I wrong. And I thought, well, you know, they they were lost and they're still lost. And so I'll try to get in with all my old Bible college buddies. And 
uh, yeah, that that didn't work out either. There's they just don't talk to me. What you think is waiting for you back there is not waiting for you back there. You can't go back. You can try. But what you think is back there is not back there. It's something far worse. That's what Peter said in 2 Peter 2. The latter end is worse than the beginning. But that's what they were going to They were going to say, let's make us captain. Let's go back to Egypt. But notice this. In, in verse 11, the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the see, Believe me. Why don't they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, and I will smite them with the pestilence. And look at here. Whew. You know what that word means? Bastard. That's what Hebrews 12 says. If you will not let God correct you and chasten you, then you are a bastard and not a son. And that word means disinherited. They have no inheritance. They're not getting anything from the Father. Nothing. God said, I will disinherit them. And I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Uh, let's see here. Where does it say... Yeah, here it is, verse 23. This is what I wanted to get to about Caleb. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and he hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. So that was the difference right there. Is and pastors, I want to I want to help you with this. Uh, Pastor Cooley and I we, we talked a little bit. You know, maybe he and I have some differences and and, and maybe some minor things thing we see, but I think we agree on a lot of things. And he's been sharply criticized by people that. I mean, we're all King James believers, but there's differences in them and. Sometimes they sharply criticize one another, and I don't like doing that. But he came up with this statement, and I like it. He said, some people believe once prayed, always saved. And I got what he was saying. Because there's this myth that floats around that says, when you pray the prayer, you're saved, and there's nothing you can do to change that. God's going to take you to heaven no matter what you do. Even if you go back to Egypt, you're going to go to heaven. And that's not true. And pastors, I want to, I want to warn you and I want to encourage you. Don't just immediately accept that everybody in your church is saved. Not, not in this day. Don't just immediately assume that because for now they're showing up every service and they're tithing and they're doing all this. I would not immediately accept that that means they're saved. You're going to be surprised by who turns against you. I've had it happen. Pastor Kelly has had it happen. Pastor Cooley has had it happen. And so probably have you and so will you. People that you thought were right. They didn't have the same spirit as you. John said they went out from us, but they were not of us. Jesus didn't say, depart from me, for I knew you for a while, but then I didn't know you after a while. That's not what he said. He said, I never knew you. And I categorically reject the idea of once prayed, always saved. Uh-uh. Let's see how their life turns out 
10 years from now, 20 years from now, are they still serving the Lord? Do they still believe the word of God? Because even some of you people out there, you've been fooled by pastors who you thought stuck with the word of God, but then you saw the change. It was gradual, but you saw it. They have a different spirit than us. That's not up for us to brag about, and it's not for us to judge. Because remember, I used to be them. God didn't leave me nor forsake me, even all that time. God just was long-suffering with me till he could bring me to a place where he could call me out. So there may be some pastors and people out there God has yet to call out, but he will call them out. So judge no man before the time. But I'm telling you, churches have people in them that are going to die and go to hell because they didn't have a spirit in them that we have. Now, what doctrine have I been talking about that hinges on Numbers 13 and 14? It's the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Because if the faith doesn't stand... And if the faith doesn't continue, uh, where is it I'm looking for? That's a good, good thing to study in your Bible, unbelief. Hebrews 3. Look at verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. We just read that story. That's Numbers 13. You take your Bible or your pure Bible search software, make a little note here, and reference Numbers 13 and 14. Because that's what we're talking about. The day of temptation in the wilderness is the day that everybody in Israel said, let's go back to Egypt. They did not believe that they could go in. They didn't believe God's two witnesses. So they said, let's go back to Egypt. And God said, you're going to die. No, I'm not letting you go back to Egypt, but you're not going to the promised land either. You're going to die right here in the wilderness. I'm going to make walk in circles for 40 years until you drop. They're going to bury your carcass here in the sand. Your children and grandchildren are going to have your funeral in a land that doesn't belong to you. Now, how are you going to like that? And that's exactly what happened. They hardened their hearts. They provoked God. Whew. You see, a guy said, a guy said one time, I believe in eternal so much of eternal security that I believe I can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. Uh, excuse me. There's a there's a term for that in the Bible. It's called tempting the Lord your God. You're just daring God to keep his promise while you go get a mark in your right hand or forehead. See what I can do? I can get a mark of the beast. And I can still go to heaven. Once saved, always saved. Once prayed, always saved. Uh-uh. That ain't how it works, people. He said, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. There's that number 40. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and they said they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. This is why a lot of your hyper-dispensationalists will reject Hebrews outright because they don't like what it says because it doesn't match their doctrinal statement. And so they invented this convenient way of excluding Hebrews from their doctrine. Hebrews is not written for us, written for the Jews, so therefore it doesn't apply to us. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, we got saved by grace through faith and will stay saved by grace through faith. But it's not grace 
even though there's unbelief. It's That's not said in the Bible. Men added that. But exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I've been there. So have you. Our sin tells us to quit, doesn't it? Our sin tries to tell us to give up on God, quit trying to live right because you're never going to do it. And after all, see, if you quit going to church and hang around Christians and start hanging around sinners, then you can do what sinners do and nobody judges you. Don't tell me you hadn't thought that. I have. And I think I'm normal. Exhort one another today, daily what is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now I want you to think about what it was that made the Israelites to stop in their tracks and not want to go in. It was just one thing. Just one. One, one, one. Fear. It's fear. And I remember a joke a guy told me about flat earth people. Flat Earth people have a saying. The only thing to sphere is sphere itself. It's, anyway, anyway. it's fear that made them stop there in the wilderness and say, let's go back to Egypt. Now, as I'm reading Hebrews, it says, exhort one another while it's called today. Because, and harden not your hearts, because... I think some things are going to happen. Some signs and some wonders are going to take place. And I think that whatever it is that happens is going to there's going to be a target on all Bible believers. Not, not fake Christians. All Bible believers. The devil and his army is going to target us specifically and say to us, we're, we're going to wipe you out. We're going to kill every one of you. And we have the power to do it. We're stronger than you are. We're gods. You're not. You're just mortal men. It's easy to kill you. We've done it hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times throughout human history. We have slain our share of men. We do not fear you. So I can see on that day where the normal me would look at that and go, okay, what is it you want me to do? Because I'll do it. While the spirit that is in me says, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't scare me. You don't scare me. What are you going to do, kill me? Go ahead. Take my life. All you're going to do is send me to heaven. You don't scare me. Remember that God has not given us the spirit of fear, nor but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I think there's going to come a day when men's hearts literally are going to fail them for fear, and they're going to bow before the alien God that descends down to the earth or rises up on the earth, whatever. They're going to bow to that God out of fear. While God's people go, you're not Jesus, you're the Antichrist. What are you looking at me that way for? You don't scare me. I have the son of the living God living inside of me. And the truth of it is, devil, I'm not afraid of you. And Jesus is not afraid of you. You're afraid of Jesus. Somebody say amen. So verse 16, for some when they heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, 
But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You ponder that. You think about that for a while. They could not go in. because, And this whole event right here, has everything to do with the giants and the fact that the land was full of giants. These were not just a couple of people with genetic abnormalities that they inherited from Adam. That was the dumbest thing I've read in the last 24 hours. That... All because you don't want to believe the Bible. You came up with that nonsense, which the Bible didn't say anything about. And it keeps using words like spurious and dubious and fringe. And let's move on. We have the half dorums. Now, here's something interesting. Deuteronomy 2, verse 19. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, and will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for possession. See, Ammon came from Lot, and so did Moab, from his own daughters. <laughs> That's gross! Anyway, uh, that was accounted also a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims. Watch out for the Zamzumims. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them. They succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. Are you, getting, are you seeing a pattern here? God. Every place the giants lived, God destroyed him. Before the flood, God destroyed him with the flood. So that none of them survived. None. And people write that down. None of them survived. Because there's a theory out there that, that says possibly the wife of Ham had Nephilim bloodline in it. Where did you get that from? Where did you dig that up? Because it's not in the Bible. Not anywhere in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say it. So if, if the Bible doesn't say it, if God is silent on it, that means skip it. God, it's, not, it's like God is saying, why are you asking me questions about something that I never said anything about? God, we need to know this. Did Adam have a bell button? Come on, God. I mean... I, I, I'm going to look in other places to see if I had a belly button. God, what? Why do we even care? Because if God didn't bother to write it in the scriptures, I mean, God goes out of his way to give you all these other details, but he never said anything about Adam having a belly button. So who cares? Obviously, the relevance of, of Adam having a belly button or not having a belly button or even a piercing in his belly button or lint in his belly button, since God is silent on it, it means that it has no relevance whatsoever to what's going to happen in the last days. Not not nothing. Um, anyway, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horums from before them. The Horums were giants. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. And the Avims, which dwelt in Tazarim, even unto Azazah, those were giants. And now look here. This is what's interesting to me. The Kaphtorims, which came forth out of Kaphtor, God destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. The Kaphtorims were giants. Now this is where it gets... Interesting. Because do you know who Kaftor was? Genesis 10, Cush begat Nimrod. 
Now, again, the there is a lot of the traditions of men that says that Nimrod was a giant. But I don't know that. I don't know it. Could he have been? Well, the Bible doesn't say. Cush begat Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, you know, it could be said that this phrase, mighty one in the earth, indicates that he, in fact, was a giant. But again, since we since we know that it was Cush and Cush was the son of Ham, so all of these are Hamies, Hamites. Cush was, Nimrod was, Philistine and Kaphtorim was. They were all from Ham. But when Cush begat Nimrod, It just, it makes you wonder who Cush's wife was. Now, again, we don't have anything in Scripture telling us that there were women giants, female giants. Not a word anywhere that I'm aware of. And I'm, you know, I've searched for this. I've looked for it. I've asked God for it. I've never seen a woman giant in the Scriptures. But we know that out of Cush, who is from Ham, it's hard to write with a mouse, isn't it? Ham, Cush was from Ham, Nimrod was from Cush, and if you go all the way down here, you see that Kaphtorim came from Ham as well. But we just read in the previous that the Kaphtorims, which came forth out of Kaphtor, God destroyed them because they were giants. It said, you know, the great many, a great pe a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them as he did the children of Esau, the Horus, the Avims, the Kaphtorims. And Kaphtorim came from Ham. So we know that Nimrod was a mighty one and a mighty hunter before the Lord, which sort of, sort of means in God's face. He, it, it doesn't imply like he was before, you know, and he walked before the Lord all the days of his life, like he walked the way God wanted him to walk. It's sort of the opposite. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. In other words, he didn't care if God was seeing him or not. He was going to do whatever he's going to do, and he's going to do it in God's face. But we know that Babel, the city of broken tongues, Nimrod was the king of it, the builder of it. The beginning of his kingdom, see, we're in Genesis 10. And it's giving you the meaning of the number 10. The number 10 is the number for kingdoms and kings, law, dominion. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna. There's that number four again. Just like the four that we saw here, 40 days. Did we see four there? Maybe. But we see four here definitely. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna a prototype of the fourth kingdom. The Antichrist, Nimrod being a type of the Antichrist. Um, so he builded, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kala and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. And Mizraim, begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Nephtuhim 
and Pethrusim and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtorim. So you have Ham, and you have Cush. Anyway, so somewhere in here, we don't know when, we don't know where, but somewhere in here, the giants show up. The angels mated with the lineage of Ham. And if you remember, Ham's lineage was cursed by Noah because it was Ham that saw his father's nakedness. So Noah cursed Ham. So to me, it's interesting that the very bloodline that Noah cursed is the bloodline that the angels chose to, in, to inject themselves into the bloodline of men and make giants. Now, again, somewhere in here it happened, but we're not told by the scriptures how or when it happened. We just know that by the time Kaftorm came along, Bada boom, bada bing. Now you've got giants who call themselves the Kaftorums after Kaftor. Now, I said all that to say this. Thursday, we will look at what the Bible says, who the sons of God are. Because that is very important. And this article... And others like it who poke fun at us, malign us, call us names, accusing us of falling into heresy. Oh, you've been reading the book of Enoch. That's your problem. Book of Enoch's not the inspired word of God, which I believe that. I didn't get my doctrine on the sons of God from the book of Enoch. And I'm telling you the truth. You can believe what I said or not. I'm telling you the truth. I have not read the book of Enoch in, in at least 15 years, if not more than 15 years. My hand to God, I'm telling you, I've not touched it. I can tell you for certain that I have not read the book of Enoch since starting the Watchmen video broadcast in 2009. And when I did the series on the Giants, three different Watchmen videos, when I did the series on the Giants, I was bound and determined to get everything that I was going to say directly from the Word of God only and not touch the Book of Enoch. I wanted to show this guy on Facebook that it could be done. And I thought it was like one, I thought it'd be like, like one Watchmen broadcast, it ended up being three. So I want to encourage all of you out there that believe the literal interpretation of the Bible in that the sons of God are evil angels. I want to encourage you that if you believe that, you don't have to stop it's because these guys are threatening to disfellowship you or shun you or whatever. You're looking at a guy that's been shunned a lot in my life. People that I thought were friends. I find out that they're not really the friends that I thought they were. Shunned because of what I believe. Shunned because of some of the things that I've said. But I believe that there is an answer to everything that goes on in this world. There's a biblical answer to it. If we'll just look and seek God out in the scriptures, then God will show us what those things are. And I'm saying this 
I guess maybe to encourage myself because I've been shunned. And it bothered me. But I can only do what the master tells me to do. I can only follow where the master leads. I can only present to people what the Spirit of God has shared with me. And so it is always my honor and my privilege to give what God has given me to you freely. The greatest blessing I have is sitting right here in this room, padded cell, talking to God's people and encouraging them don't stop believing. That's a song, isn't it? Don't stop believing the Word of God. And let people accuse you of whatever they're going to accuse you. Did you know that they have to make up lies? You have to make up lies. For some reason, God won't let them have the truth, which you ought to be thankful for. So while you get mad and say, they lied, they lied about me. Do you, do you really want them telling the truth about you? Do you? Is that what you really crave? Right? You get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. If they're, uh, <laughs> they're lying about me, thank God. <laughs> they're lying about me, though. I'd rather have it that way. Uh, when we get into this Sons of God issue on Thursday, be ready, because I'm not going to hold back. I know 